Well, hello there. I'm, I'm Richard, and I'm from the Rugby Pie Foundation, and I'm here to talk a bit about the Raspberry Pi and how it was designed so that young people like me and students like me can have the tools and inspiration to start programming and make the world a cooler place through home the engineering. I know that Evan Upton, the founder of Raspberry Pi Foundation, was originally meant to be giving this talk, but he's been asked to attend Nature Fair in New York, and as a result of some dodgy flight booking, is currently clearing US immigration. And I guess that US immigration probably would be too happy if uh, someone was attempting to do a talk on Raspberry Pi whilst attempting or waiting to pass through passport control. Um, so I'd just like to ask you all a question, if you can all hear me quite well. Um, how many of you actually own Raspberry Pis? Can you raise your hand so I can see? And, and how, okay, brilliant. And, and how are you kind of waiting for one to arrive or considering buying one? Oh, cool, that's lots of you. So, um, so I'd like to, I'm going to cover most of the things that um, Evan was planning to do with his talk. And I also feel that I'm also in quite a good position to give you, uh, to talk to you, as I'm still a student at university and have actual experience of all the reasons the Pi was created. Um, I can't emphasize strongly how much the foundation was created to start and started to help young people be able to be all that they can be and, and to give them the tools to become real engineers uh, right now and not to wait till they start their career or arrive at university. And I guess the test that we um, actually kind of done a reasonable job with the Raspberry Pi is the fact that um, I'm here now kind of evangelizing the, the Raspberry Pi and, and we've all kind of gone out of borders and they obviously it must be a kind of cool thing to go with. So uh, what is the Raspberry Pi? Um, the Raspberry Pi is a credit card size, and if you've got some of this in case you've somehow managed to have been stuck in a hole for the past uh, 12 months, uh, it looks like this. Um, and it can be hooked up to your standard TV and along with a spare keyboard or mouse, and you can essentially use it as a desktop PC, and there's all the things a desktop PC does, like spreadsheets, uh, word processing, it can play high definition video, and play games like Quake 3. But along with that, it's also a great way to get into programming, and offers something for every level of ability ranging from MIT Scratch for um, children who want to learn the program for their first time, uh, Python interpreters for those who want to start writing games, and access to the Linux kernel for those who want to become real pros and have a go at kernel hacking. Before we enter more details on the Pi, I want to tell you a little bit more about the history of how it came about. And the idea it came about when Evan Upton, the director of the Raspberry Pi Foundation, was working as a director of studies at uh, computer science at St. John's College, Cambridge, after completing his PhD. He found there was a significant decline in the number of applicants and the level of knowledge that these applicants had come into this course. He was particularly concerned that the low-level programming skills that we needed as part of everyday use of early computers, that our parents, my parents, and the older generation uh, would have actually used um, almost every day, to vanish if people grew up as much more complicated and polished computers, of kind, such as the Windows PCs and your Macs, uh, which made it much harder for kids like, like myself to pick up these low-level skills as kind of as just using computers in everyday life. So when Evan first started Cambridge back in 1995, everyone um, who came in on his cohort was growing up on a diet of BBC Micros and ZX Spectrums, which started, grew directly into uh, command line as the Raspberry Pi does. So they immediately get hands-on experience of how computers work and how to program straight away, which meant there were lots of applicants at that time with many years of hands-on, gritty, dirty programming experience which led to a very high level, level of high quality applicants, approximately six of every place. However, if we fast forward now to 2005, when Evan was director of studies at Cambridge for computer science, he was only receiving two or three applicants for each place. You see, the problem we were getting um, was that we, uh, well, I, my generation, um, as I like to call myself part of the GUI generation, the graphical user interface generation, where everything is presented to us on a plate and we can go and surf the internet and do a multitude of things with a computer which requires a limited set of knowledge. Whereas when using the BBC micros and dead expression, anything you might have to create yourself, whereas I could just immediately load up a browser, load up Microsoft Word or anything, and straight away. Um, so growing up in this kind of in this environment has created a big problem for us. So there are kind of two reasons that um, to, which has reduced our, um, my generation's ability to use computers. And so you've got two, two, two kinds of computing devices that have this. Firstly, you've got games consoles, which are like, generally the first device that's got a computer that most kind of children see, they have access to, to play computer games on. But games consoles are generally designed to be completely closed source, closed platforms, and not meant to be programmable. That means they're designed to play games, and not to create games. Um, well, admittedly, Call of Duty looks a lot better at uh, playing Pong or Pac-Man. We tend to have a lot less idea about how they work, and you're totally unable to hack around with them. 
this is part, partly due to the business model that when quite often hardware manufacturers sell games consoles at a loss and tend to make their money through royalties selling games. But the other kind of device, which I've already mentioned earlier, is going through the home PC, predominantly running Windows. Um, these devices are everyone using in schools to do your homework on. But we're also really fortunate to have them. Many people consider the home PC to be nothing more than Microsoft Office and a browser, uh, which is great. But they don't consider it a tool for inventing. It's most good people, if PCs are so incredibly complex at the moment, that they're designed to be as easy as possible to use. They're designed for it to be used, not to design or to develop on. Um, most of our operating systems are phenomenally good for the the use of the actual workings of the computer. Many of the features that Edwin would have had to program on from scratch in his cloud meters have already been provided to it. So there's no need to understand how they work or why they work or how they were made. They just do. They're, they're perfect. They just work almost straight out of the box. And, and so modern home computing has changed how it's focused on using rather than creating. And that's, not, that, that's the bad for our generation that insp in, to inspire engineers of my generation. Um, now, PCs should be brilliant for programming. They're vastly more powerful than the BBC Micro and its 8-bit contemporaries. Um, but with the advent of the internet, it's really easy to, and it's really easy to download and development tools. So it should be very easy for people to develop. The limit is now there's this kind of energy barrier in between the user and the computer to develop on. Whereas with the, with the, with the 8-bit micro or the BBC micro, it, you go straight in and develop from, from the word go. You, can, you have to start on the plan line at the beginning. So this, now there's this barrier which you have to go and acquire the tool to develop on. You have to actually want to go and show the program while it's being put in front of them. If you can think of it like this, it, 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 um, the PCs are in fact a, a kind of like a family car. It, it's a tool that, that your the whole family uses. It's a piece at home you have a family computer that sits in the lounge. And it's definitely parents will discourage their children from trying to put development tools and have your software out of it. Because if it all breaks, then the whole family can't use it. The whole mum can't go and do the online grocery shopping and dad can't do the accounts or whoever the parents can't do the things they want to use the PC for and, and the siblings as well. And um, whereas we're all the something that's much more akin to um, a child's body. I mean, you wouldn't let a, 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 your child go and take, take apart your family car. You wouldn't let them do that. But with a bike, it's their bike. They can dismantle it how they like, put it back together. And it doesn't work. It just means they're going to have to walk around for quite a while. And we want to convince them and come up with something that's akin to that. And so the toy in, in, our, in this analogy is kind of much more, much more like the bike. So the, the child can go and develop on it straight away. And if it breaks, well, it's just there to the broken it and try and fix it. It doesn't impact anyone else in the family or the environment around them. So we're in danger at the moment of ending a point where people don't need to understand and get out of the computer outside the web browser in order to do a lot of tasks. So what's great for the average user, as I've already mentioned, it's really to a significant decline the skills and knowledge of the future generation of engineers, my generation of engineers, and that's about the universities and bad for the industry. So Anne Rettner reckons recognised this was a problem. Um, back in 2006, a bunch of guys at the Department of Computer Science at the University of Cambridge. But so they wanted to make a device that was so affordable enough and low level enough to, then, to, then to act at the actual workings of the computer and the operating system cheaply and easily. So, cost was a major factor uh, to allow everyone to be able to buy a Raspberry Pi and buy a with this computer they were creating. So, they decided that it should cost the cost of the textbook. So, so, they decided upon the price of $25. Now, today, they at that point had never bought a textbook. In recent memory, because buying textbooks for my time are more like $50. So there we go. So $25 is originally cut with the price. Um, so that anyone who owned it, you know, would, is a matter of regard for the computing device they already own. We want this to be an additional device, not a direct placement for a home PC. So people wouldn't be afraid to tinker with it. And that's the, that's the beauty of the fact that you can go and tinker with it and break it and fix it and just do whatever you can. And we just really began having them things to the point that a child can stop being comfortable and a student can stop being the working to the full home PC. We wanted children to be able to use their own device themselves with no fear of breaking it and to feel invested in their own work. The problem was that back in 2006, building a cheap, basic computer just couldn't be done, and especially without the buying power of a large company. Now, as we fast forward again back to 2010, um, when Evan was working for a large a semiconductor, uh, a semiconductor architect for a company called Broadcom, which incidentally is where I'm working at the moment, um, and, and he worked on the Cambridge Science part. And we realised that the mobile process that he was developing at the time would be perfect for this Raspberry Pi idea, and this idea that he had been wanting to build for the past four years. While that particular design was only used as a, a proof of concept in that in-house, it shows that it shows that um, Evan's dream.
dream could become true, it was possible, it was a possible reality. And um, the, the, the past from the 2010, 2011, this um, uh, process that uh, video for was developed and prototype board. And this is what was originally shown on um, on a blog of Rory Sellen Jones on the first <coughs> of the graphic first prototype was shown. Now, quite naively, they, they let this um, prototype be shown because it went from no one knowing about it to 600,000 YouTube hits in two days. And so they have inadvertently overnight said, hey world, we can all make, we can make you everyone a computer for $25, which was a, a bit of a mistake to start. So they were supposed to create a board and the processor architecture to go with it. And all that was left to get, to get uh, an operating system on it and an interface to, to kind of get it going. And if you want to have a good command line interface, so then you have the same experience as you would have in the ZX Spectrum or the DC Micro. And so using Linux was clearly the obvious choice. And not to mention the, the world of development tools that were already available to it. So um, a, 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 the sort of, a team of Broad Run and in that bad time helped us develop all these tools and uh, to create the Linux um, uh, releases that we have on for the five today. So with this uh, development of the Linux tools, there's a proof that we needed that this could happen and we realized that this is a dream to be possible. And so, um, it, it's one of the, this has been developed now from all the from this basic thing back in 2006 um, all the way forward to now as uh, the pie that we can buy today. So um, what what's great about the pie is that it allows them to make things and to bring back this kind of making and playing with and breaking with breaking and fixing culture that we can people can use with computing and it's a bit of kind of basic desire of engineers which is to do cool stuff. To do things that we go, that would be really awesome. You can go to show to a friend and you go, that was awesome. How did you do it? And you know, for the bragging rights in fact, not always in fact for the end result, but part of the journey, the, the, the process you go through of building it and um, all the way through. So from this, we've now, we've now kind of created, since it was released back in February, we've now got a whole community of uh, people building stuff. Because originally the Pi Foundation, wanted, we wanted to um, to create a whole ecosystem of tools and the classrooms and development. Um, and, but now we have a community who's wanting to do it for the kind of computing in school that they're not the work on that as well. Um, and yeah, so I also, I suppose that was quite, from now I should give a few examples of um, products that have been done. Um, so the example of things you can do is like, lots of people have either acquired pies and have not really sure what to do with them at the moment. Um, I originally was one of those before I started working uh, with the foundation. Um, so the people who uh, put the Raspberry Pi inside a, um, a weather balloon, uh, attached some cameras to it, and then sent it up to uh, a few thousand feet and had it brought down and all got down safely. So it's also proved the uh, resilience of this kind of little credit card computer. Um, just this morning, I saw a, a system that had the Raspberry Pi up the top, so it's a little thermal printer, um, and using the Fortune. Um, uh, accessory and application in Linux, and it can predict your fortune if you drop a, a couple of coins into it, which is quite awesome. Um, the people running um, XDMC on it, the Xbox Media Center, um, a big, uh, which is potentially a really, really powerful media player, which is running on, on the on this little binary Raspberry Pi, which would normally run on a, you need a media cell, a media computer to do. So, um, to um, end all of this, I'd like to uh, open to any questions you might have about the Pi, and um, I hope you've been able to hear exactly the whole thing. And I'm kind of sitting quite far away from you now. <laughs> Thank you. Who's 15? Uh, and she said, yeah, right, what do I do with that? Um, she wants to be an engineer rather than uh, um, uh, anything to do with computing, which the rest of her family is into, apart from her dad. So she, she and her dad built the pie house. So we, we have this here. Um, and then, of course, there was the, the Magpie, which is the, the uh, Raspberry Pi Foundation magazine. And it came out, and there was a shaky hand game that, that, that was in there. And my work colleague, who sits opposite me, kept going on and on and on. So it would be really cool, really cool to have this. And my husband, who's a bit practical, said, well, I can do the hardware for you. You, know, you just need to wire it into the Pi. Well, at that point, I had to get Paul to wire it into the pie. So we have an example of the shaky hand game. Um, so a collaborative effort between most of my family who are into more the engineering side 
Um, Paul, who could wire it up for me, and I, I programmed it. So I typed that in and got the libraries going. Then, of course, my son came home at the weekend, uh, and I showed him the pie, uh, and he said, oh, I've seen this thing that's really cool. If you can get it to be controlled, um, you know, you can get the Wii, <coughs> the Wii handsets uh, working through it. So he's, he created, on Sunday afternoon, having never seen Python, I mean, he, he, he writes in Flash and Flex, he's never seen Python, but by the end of the afternoon, he'd coded a text Pong <coughs> game, if you like, uh, using the Wii controllers. I do give a warning, though, it's not good for epileptics to look at, because it's a constant refresh of the screen. One day I'll teach him about the device... Uh, the, the graphics context and how to work that. <laughs> if he ever listens to his mother. Uh, and then we've got one just running the standard um, Rasp Diem setup that's just there. Actually, two of them have got the standard setup. So that's what we've got for you to have a look at tonight.